let's rock some quantitative easing. On the line with us is Dean Baker, the co-founder and senior economist at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. CEPR.net is the website. Uh, you can tweet him at CEPRDC or Dean Baker 13. Uh, Dean, welcome back. It's been a while since we've talked, and I, I, I find your, your analysis on quantitative easing which, you know, please everybody, don't glaze over your eyes with these, <laughs> these economic phrases. This is, this is actually a big deal. This, this impacts all of us. Um, uh, first of all, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on again, Tom. Oh, it's always a pleasure. So quantitative easing, uh, basically, you know, down to the bottom line here, is when the Fed starts buying bonds including now corporate bonds, which, you know, I mean, back during the, the World War II, you point out they were buying federal government bonds, but now they're buying corporate bonds as well. And this kind of lifts the stock market and, um, and lifts corporate profits uh, in, in particular because their bonds are being purchased. Uh, and, and that seems like it would only benefit rich people. You want to give us a little more of a, a deep dive into what they're doing and, and why it's of consequence to all of us? Yeah, a coordinated easing really has gotten a bad bill for exactly the story people have given the story you, you've said, which is part, partly accurate. But let me go through a little more background. Sure. Ordinarily, the Fed has acted primarily by controlling the overnight uh, discount rate. This isn't going to mean anything to anyone, but banks are required to have reserves on every night. So their nights, every night their reserves, they have to have reserves based on their deposits. Won't go into details, but let's just say 10%. So if you're a huge bank, you have 100 billion on deposit, you have to have 10 billion in reserves. If you don't have that, you borrow that from other banks. So this is the overnight money rate. And that's what the Fed has typically controlled. Use that to, they wanna bring about more growth, they lower the rate, if they want to see less growth, presumably to stem inflation, they raise the rate. And that has been what they used through the 80s, the 90s, uh, the, the first decade of, of this century. But you run into a problem. They hit zero. So in the Great Recession, we got that rate to zero. And at that point, you can't really do much further with it. You actually had small negative rates in some European countries. Now we're going into that, but basically zero is a floor on that. So then if you want to further affect the economy, what do you do? Well, you have to try and affect longer-term rates directly, and that means buying bonds. Um, so the Fed always is primarily concerned about longer-term rates because that is what affects the economy. So this is what we're, where I'm saying longer-term rates. You have a mortgage. You have a 30-year mortgage, a 15-year mortgage. That's a longer-term rate. You have a five-year car loan. That's a longer-term rate. Those are what directly affects the economy. The overnight money rate, that banks worry about that, but that only indirectly affects the economy. So what they wanted to do was bring bring down longer term rates. They did as much as they could with the overnight rate, pushed it to zero. So then you got what we've referred to as quantitative easing. They buy up government bonds. They buy up mortgage-backed securities issued by Fannie and Freddie. And you mentioned corporate bonds. That was a real departure. That that was they hadn't done that. I, I'm not sure if they ever had done that in the past, but they did that last year. That program ended at the end of 2020. So they're no longer buying up corporate bonds. But the idea was to reduce the interest rates that people pay on their car loans, that people pay on their mortgages. If they have credit card debt, reduces the interest rate people pay on credit card debt. And this creates more jobs. You, you see people refinance mortgages, and they freed up, in many cases, thousands of dollars in interest payments. And they use that money to, to buy other things. So this was helping to support the economy in, through the pandemic and continues to help support the economy. Um, one feature, as you say, does tend to drive up the stock market. Other things equal, lower interest rates will give you a higher stock market. But to my view, you know, I'm not a big fan. I want to see the stock market double or what. I'm not, you know, that, that's not something on my agenda. But I'm not going to get upset about that if that's an outcome of trying to create more jobs in the economy. But isn't the risk here, Dean, that by this kind of really unprecedented intervention, um, you know, buying, buy, you know, General Motors and United Airlines bonds and things like that, that uh, in order to sustain the economy and to promote job growth and, and, and you know, all these good, uh, arguably progressive outcomes, that we're creating an economy that's kind of a Potemkin village. It's, it's, 
it's not really it doesn't have a real foundation it's 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 uh, you know it's it's we're addicted to to QE basically well a couple points here first off during the pandemic we had pretty much had to do everything we could to support the economy. oh I get that uh, you know again I just um, but, you know, again, obviously, you know, we all see the numbers, so it's not as though the pandemic's over, but let, let's hope for the moment we're through the worst of it. Um, most of the economy has reopened. So then the question is, okay, will we somehow be better with higher interest rates? And I just have a hard time seeing that argument. So, you know, this story, it's an artificial economy. There, there isn't a natural economy. So it's not as though we had some natural economy out there and then the Fed came in there and messed it up. I mean, the Fed is there. Huh. We have a central bank. Um, there, there isn't a natural economy that we could pose as a counterexample. So, so Friedman and Hayek was, were wrong. <laughs> there's, the, you know, there's not yeah, some yeah, no, magical I, I capitalist it's, floor. It's, it's a very fundamental point that, you know, I think it gives the right way too much credence because if you juxtapose, oh, we have the government intervening and then on the other hand, we have the natural economy. You go, well, maybe we should check out this natural economy. You go, no, I'm sorry, there is no natural economy. The government is going to intervene. And all we're arguing about is how best to intervene. Do we want higher rates? Do we want lower rates? I mean, obviously, we intervene in a thousand other ways as well. But it's not as though there's some natural economy out there that the Fed is coming in there and messing up. So, so this is... You know, I, I, for example, I, I look at Japan, you know, they've had this kind of 20-year slog uh, is the way it's characterized by some folks, you know, of, uh, you know, kind of a, a stagnant economy. But on the other hand, you know, they have a national health care system, they have a, str a robust social safety net, college is free. Um, so it's not really, you know, it's not like the people of Japan are suffering greatly. Um, and, and some argue that that's because the the Japanese central bank had so aggressively intervened in their economy 20 years ago. Is is that the sort yeah, of thing? Go ahead. Yeah, no, and, and and I think the Japan story is informative that way because you know people aren't suffering there, so they've had slow growth, but that's in part because they've had declining size of their workforce. I mean, that's their population. I mean, it's not that people aren't able to get jobs; they actually have very low unemployment. It's that you know people are you know they, they had the baby boom story, but it was somewhat earlier than ours. So you know they have an older population and a it's declining aging workforce. Out. Yeah, so it's not it's not like something really horrible has happened there, you know. And again, I just pose the question: Well, suppose the Fed, the, their central bank had been less aggressive and they had higher interest rates. Is there any story you could tell where things would be better off for people in Japan right now? And again, I just find that one very hard to to tell. Yeah. So so uh, this is this is fascinating. We're talking with Dean Baker, the co-founder and senior economist at the Center for Economic and Policy Research, CEPR.net. So, Dean, you're, are you suggesting that quantitative easing, that the, gov that the Federal Reserve uh, Bank intervene, intervening in markets by buying corporate bonds, by basically subsidizing parts of corporate America or supporting, I, I, maybe you couldn't call it a subsidy, is actually not just a strategy that was useful to get us through the crisis of COVID and, and to get us through uh, the 2008, you know, the Bush crash, but that also going forward on a long-term basis, this could be part of a progressive agenda? Well, uh, again, I'm, uh, I'll be a little hesitant on the corporate bond part. So, and mm -hmm. they, they actually ended that at the end of last year. So that was a special program that was established for the pandemic, right. ended at the end of 220. And, and you know, again, I'll say I, I'm a little uncomfortable with that just because you're in effect favoring certain corporations at the expense of because they're not buying every corporate bond, understandably, sure. and they bought packages just to be clear. So they weren't going out and buying a GM bond, and you know they bought packages of bonds. But in any case, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with that for the obvious reason. But the more general process, quantitative easing, is buying government debt, and then they bought Fannie and Freddie their mortgage-backed securities because that's in effect government debt that's guaranteed right. by the government so right. these, the, this and that's is, supporting the housing market lowering the interest rates on uh, on those debt those bonds and that indirectly lowers a whole set of interest rates throughout the economy right that's absolutely fascinating dean baker i i think probably for the first time i have a, a, a intellectually a better grasp of of qe and 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 its consequences uh, i i viewed it uh, probably through that right-wing lens that you were talking about dean thanks so much for dropping by today it's great talking with you